Oh, hey. I'm glad you came back. I hope you're enjoying Lemony Snicket's book, A Bad Beginning. Why not jump in to chapter number three? As you know, yesterday we left, left Violet, Klaus, and Sunny right in the new house after just meeting Count Olaf. Here we go, chapter three. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but first impressions are often entirely wrong. You can look at a painting for the very first time, for example, and not like it at all. But after looking at it for a little bit longer, you may find it very pleasing. The first time you try gorgonzola cheese, you might find it a little bit too strong. But when you're older, you may want to eat nothing but gorgonzola cheese. Klaus, when Sonny was born, did not like her at all. But by the time she was six weeks old, the two of them were thick as thieves. Your initial opinion on just about anything may change over time. I wish I could tell you that the Baudelaire's first impression of Count Olaf and the house was incorrect. As first impressions so often are. But these impressions that Count Olaf was a horrible person and his house was depressingly a pigsty were absolutely correct. During the first few days after the orphan's arrival at Count Olaf's, Violet, Klaus, and Sonny attempted to make themselves feel at home but it was really no use. Even though Count Olaf's house was quite large, the three children were placed together in one filthy bedroom and it only had one small bed. Violet Klaus took turns sleeping in it so that every other night one of them was in the bed and the other was sleeping on the hard wooden floor. And the bed's mattress was so lumpy it was difficult for them to stay comfortable. To make a bed for Sunny, Violet removed the dusty curtains from the curtain rod that hung over the bedroom's one window and bunched them together to form a sort of cushion, just big enough for her sister. However, without curtains over the cracked glass, the sun streamed through the window every morning, so the children woke up super early. Instead of a closet, there was a large cardboard box that had once held a refrigerator and would now hold the three children's clothes all piled in a heap instead of toys. Books! Oh, we have a little picture of our friends. Instead of toys, books, and other things to amuse the youngsters, Count Olaf had provided a small pile of rocks. And the only decoration of the peeling walls was a large, ugly painting of, you guessed it, an eye. Matching the one on Count Olaf's ankle, and the ones all over the house. But the children knew, as I'm sure you now know, that the worst surroundings in the world can be tolerated if the people in them are interesting and kind. Count Olaf was neither interesting nor kind. He was demanding, short-tempered, and really bad-smelling. The only good thing to be said for Count Olaf was that he wasn't around very often. And when the children woke up to choose their clothing out of the refrigerator box, they would walk into the kitchen, find a long list of instructions left by, the, left by Count Olaf for them, and he would often not appear until nighttime. Most of the day, he spent out of the house or up in the very high tower where the children were forbidden to go. The instructions he left for them were usually difficult chores, such as repainting the back porch or repairing the windows. And instead of the signature, Count Olaf would draw an eye right at the bottom of the note. One morning his note read, My theater troupe would be coming to dinner before tonight's performance. Have dinner ready by ten. Have dinner ready for all ten of them by the time they arrive at seven o'clock. Buy the food, prepare it, set the table, serve the dinner, clean up afterward, and stay out of our way. Below there was the usual I, and underneath the note was a small sum of money for groceries. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny read a note as they ate their breakfast, which was gray, lumpy oatmeal Count Olaf had left each morning in a large pot on the stove. Then they looked at each other in dismay. None of us know how to cook, Klaus said. That's true. I knew how to repair those windows and clean the chimney, but those sorts of things interest me. But I don't know how to cook anything except toast. And sometimes you burn toast, Klaus said. And they smiled. They were both remembering a time when the two of them got up early to make a special breakfast for their parents. 
Violet had burned the toast and their parents, smelling smoke, ran downstairs to see what was the matter. And when they saw Violet and Klaus looking forlornly at the pieces of pitch black toast, they laughed and laughed. Then they made pancakes for the whole family. I wish they were here, Violet said. She did not have to explain she was talking about their parents. They would never let us stay in this dreadful place. If they were here, Klaus said. He was raising his voice rising as he got a little bit more upset. We would not be with Count Olaf in the first place. I hate it here, Violet. I hate this house. I hate this room. I hate having to do all these chores, and I hate Count Olaf. I hate it too, Violet said. And Klaus looked at his older sister with a relief. Sometimes just saying that you hate something and having someone agree with you can make you feel a little bit better about a terrible situation. I hate everything about our lives right now, Klaus, she said. But we have to keep our chin up. That was an expression the children's father used to say, and it meant something like, try to stay cheerful. You're right, Klaus said. But it's very difficult to keep one's chin up and count all off, keep shoving it down. Shook! Sonny shrieked, banging on the table with her oatmeal spoon. Violet and Klaus were jerked out of their conversation and looked once again at Count Olaf's note. Perhaps we could find a cookbook and read about how to cook, Klaus said. It shouldn't be that difficult to make a simple meal. Violet and Klaus spent several minutes opening and shutting Count Olaf's cupboards, but there weren't any cookbooks to be found. I can't say I'm surprised, Violet said. We haven't found any books in this house at all. I know, Klaus said miserably. I miss reading very much. We must go out and look at the library sometime soon. But not today. Today we have to cook for ten people. At that moment, there was a knock on the front door. Who in the world would want to visit Count Olaf? Violet wondered out loud. Maybe someone wants to visit us, Klaus said, without much hope. In the time since the Baudelaire parents' death, most of the orphan's friends had fallen by the wayside. An expression what's here means they stopped calling, writing, and stopping by to see any of the Baudelaire's making them feel very lonely. You and I, of course, would never do this to any of our grieving acquaintances. But it's a sad truth in life that when someone has lost a loved one, friends sometimes avoid that person just when the presence of friends is needed most. Violet Klaus and Sonny walked slowly to the front door and peered through the peephole which was just in the shape of an eye. They were delighted to see Justice Strauss peering back at them and opened the door. Justice Strauss, Violet said. How lovely to see you. Do come in. But then she realized Justice Strauss would probably not want to venture into a dim and dirty room. P please forgive me for not stopping by sooner. I just was walking by and I wanted to see you, how you children were settling in but I had a very difficult case in the high court and it was taking up very much of my time. What sort of case was it? Klaus said. Having been deprived of reading, he was hungry for new information. Well, I can't really discuss it, Justice Strauss said, because it's official business, but I can tell you it concerns a poisonous plant and illegal use of someone's credit card. Yeek! Shani shrieked, which appeared to mean I'm as excited as you are to turn the next page. How interesting! Although, of course, there is no way that Sonny could understand what was being said. Justice Strauss looked down at Sonny and laughed. He can indeed, she said, and reached down to pat the poor child on the head. Sonny took Justice Strauss's hand and bit it gently. That means she likes you, Violet explained. She bites very hard if she doesn't like you. Or if you want to give her a bath. I see, Justice Strauss said. Now then, how are you children getting on? Is there anything that you desire? The children looked at one another, thinking of all the things they desired. Another bed, for example, a proper crib for Sonny, curtains for the windows, a closet instead of a cardboard box. But what they desired most of all, of course, was not to be associated with Count Olaf in any way whatsoever. What they desired most was to be with their parents again in their true home, but that, of course, was impossible. Violet Claus and Sonny looked all down at the floor unhappily and considered the question, but finally Klaus spoke. Ah, uh, could we perhaps borrow a cookbook? He said, Count Olaf instructed us to make dinner for the theater troupe tonight, and we can't find a cookbook in this house. <gasps> Goodness, cooking dinner for an entire troupe seems an awful lot to ask of children. Count Olaf gives us lots of responsibilities, Violet said. Count Olaf is an evil man, is what she wanted to say, but she was well-mannered. Well, why don't you come next door to my house, Justice Stroud said, and find a cookbook that pleases you. 
The youngsters agreed, and they followed Justice Strauss out the door, over the well-kept house. Over to the well-kept house. She led them through the elegant hallway, smelling of flowers, in an enormous room. And when they saw what was inside, they nearly fainted with delight. Klaus especially. The room was not a library. Not a public library, but a private library. That is, a large collection of books belonging to Justice Strauss. There were shelves and shelves and shelves of them on every wall from floor to ceiling. And separate shelves and shelves in the middle of the room. The only place there weren't books was in a corner where there were some large, comfortable-looking chairs and a wooden table with lamps hanging on them, perfect for reading. Although it was not as big as their parents' library, it was cozy, and the Baudelaire children were thrilled. My word, Violet said, this is such a wonderful library. Oh, thank you very much. I, I've been collecting books for years. I'm very proud of my collection. As long as you keep them in good condition, you're welcome to use any of my books at any time. Now, the cookbooks are just over here in the eastern wall. Shall we have a look at them? Yes. And then if you don't mind, I, I would love to look at some of your books concerning mechanical engineering. Inventing things is a great interest of mine. And I would like to read a book about wolves, Klaus said. Recently, I've been fascinated by the subject of the wild animals of North America. Book, Sonny shrieked, which probably meant, please don't forget to pick out a picture book for me. Justice Strauss smiled. It was a pleasure to see people interested in the books. But first, I think we'd better find a good recipe, don't you? The children agreed. And for 30 minutes or so, they perused several cookbooks that Justice Strauss recommended. To tell you the truth, the three orphans were so excited to be out of Count Olaf's house and in this pleasant library that they were a little distracted and unable to concentrate on cooking. But finally, Klaus found a dish that sounded delicious and easy to make. Listen to this, he said. Puntinesca. It's an Italian sauce for pasta. All we need to do is saute olives, capers, anchovies, garlic, chopped parsley, and tomatoes together in a giant pot. Prepare spaghetti to go with it. Well, that sounds easy, Violet agreed, and the Baudelaire orphans looked at one another. Perhaps with kind Justice Strauss and her library right next door, the children could prepare pleasant lives for themselves. As easily as they could, Puntinesca for Count Olaf. Tune in tomorrow as we jump in to Chapter 4 and find out how well that Puntinesca goes for the children. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Have a great Thursday, and I can't wait to see you soon. Have a great night.